Hello and welcome to my video. My name is Cami, and I am a chronically online college student and this video is for my Philosophy 8 class. In this course we're going to explore the origins, the histories, and the significant ideas of the world's major religions and I think that's really exciting. This YouTube video is my alternative assignment uh, for Module 1 where we discuss different approaches to the study of religions and the significance of this study. Before I go any further though, I just want to let you know that I will have all of my sources listed in the description box below if you want to do your own research. All right, let's get into it. Before I can talk about my connection with the texts in the videos, I need to lay down a strong foundation for anyone watching this who may need to know more about the material. Dr. Florian opened our module this week assuring us that this class is an academic philosophy class about religion and not a religion class. But what even is religion? <laughs> well, as we'll discuss later, there are many interpretations and definitions of religion, but most simply it's a multi-layered series of teachings and practices that people can interact with in many different ways. But why? Why are there so many different interpretations of the various religions? Well, Dr. Glorian explains that some views are just opinions based on our perspectives and biases, but other differences come from the difference in levels of maturity. In a developmental model, religion can mean different things to people who are at different levels of development. This model can be helpful because it allows a person to make sense of the different ways the same scriptures may be taught and still be able to find a takeaway at the end. Parallel to this developmental model, we have a leveled approach to studying religions, pre-rational, rational, and post-rational. There's also a descriptive and a critical approach, but we'll touch more on that later. A pre-rational approach to religion is the notion that believing or participating in religion is juvenile and silly, and once you mature, you're going to see that and you're going to move past it. A rational approach means to use your own mind to think about teaching and discover the meanings within. This person studies and interprets the scriptures, and a post-rational approach means going beyond the mind. Post-rational thinkers are going to move past studying and interpreting the scriptures and instead begin experiencing the truths of their studies. The most important takeaway from this section was what Dr. Glorian said, quote, from a philosophical point of view, we can question everything. And this resonates with me because I've always self-identified as curious and I want to be a lifelong learner. And so when reading this, I wrote in my notes, quote, this basically describes me. <laughs> it also brings to mind the thought of young children who are trying to find where they fit in their world and they ask a million questions. What's that? Where'd it come from? Why? 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 To the point of annoyance. I was one of the, but why, kids. And honestly, I still am as an adult. When my boyfriend's eight-year-old nephew starts asking questions, uh, many of which I don't have a good answer for, I help him dig in and search for answers and ask follow-up questions with him and we explore. And you would not believe the amount of cool dinosaur facts I know now because of that eight-year-old, but I can share those at some other time. What I'm trying to say is that asking questions is crucial to developing a deeper understanding of anything. Humans, we're curious by nature and we yearn for answers about our origins and the inevitabilities of our existence. And this is possibly one reason why so many different religions ask the same questions about the purpose of our lives, how to win the battle of good and evil, and what it means to be human. Why are we here? Now that the foundation is established, it's time to start searching for some more answers and maybe even finding some more questions to ask along the way. So, if a post-rational approach involves experiencing the truths of scripture, it's understandable then why it's the approach that's found mostly in mystical worldviews. But wait, what do I mean when I say mystical? Well, I don't mean mystical in a fantasy Lord of the Rings sword fights and magic kind of way, but rather in the way of religious scholars who have made a choice and committed to following a religious path. 
Mysticism is the part of religion that focuses less on theory or dogma and more on specific practices and disciplines, which can allow a transformational experience. I'm going to talk more about this later when I talk about realities and leveled thinking. There are different levels of both experience and interpretation, and that's why it's important for me and for all of us to remember as we traverse this unknown territory to ask if we find ourselves having an emotional response to ask ourselves what is going on where is this emotion coming from and what level of thinking am i engaging in that's eliciting this response the descriptive approach to studying religion is coming to a deeper understanding of what the religions teach by describing it and learning about it. However, this has the potential to devolve because it's too easy for us as humans to criticize what we don't understand. For me, I make critical and unproductive comments and assumptions about traditions within certain aspects of Christianity that I, I don't understand fully, but I've not made an effort to go and speak with someone of that faith to gain better understanding. Similarly, there's a whole community of people on Reddit who snark on fundamentalist Christians. They exist inside this echo chamber and, to my knowledge, do not engage with the fundy influencers that they criticize. And while you can't tell from the screenshot I inserted, I am a member of this Reddit community, though I am a much more passive consumer and I very rarely engage in the discourse, but I have noticed a shift in my views regarding these figures and my assumptions of their beliefs based only on the information within this subreddit. Dr. Glorian reminds us that while there is a place for criticism, it needs to be intelligent if it's going to be meaningful. I don't see the criticism I mentioned as intelligent or meaningful, but rather as a way for people to crap on pre-rational ideas and content coming from these ideas out of the mouths of these fundamentalist figures. I just want to say not all of the snark and criticism is unwarranted or undeserved. There have been plenty of instances of these individual influencers acting bigoted, racist, transphobic, anti-semitic, homophobic, and misogynistic. And behavior such as that definitely deserves some level of public humiliation based on the context of our modern society. But I don't think it justifies the most common comments that I usually see on any of these posts about the typically female Fundy influencers. These comments are along the lines of, why doesn't she just leave? Why does she act like this? Oh my god, she's so brainwashed. Doesn't she realize she's in a cult? What is she thinking? And in one way, these comments seem understandable and at times even justified, but on the other hand, these viewpoints and the comments completely disregard the fact that religion can be a source of oppression for many women. And not only the religion, but also the culture which it originates. In a lot of cases, that can be even more oppressive than just the religious belief on its own. Very much like how scientists seek out the laws of science, spiritual teachers have taught that there are similar spiritual laws. Did you know that all religions teach a version of the golden rule? I didn't. But if you never went to Sunday school or kindergarten or you haven't seen Bambi, the golden rule says that if you don't want something done to you, you don't do it to others. If you can't say something nice, Don't say nothing at all. So, in the evolution of religion, different sects appeared. A sect is a group of people with somewhat different religious beliefs from those of a larger group to which they belong. For example, within the umbrella of Christianity, you can find many different sects that all have teachings that vary slightly or broadly. The Pew Research Center actually conducted their religious landscape study in 2007 and again in 2014. And what they did is they surveyed more than 35,000 Americans from all 50 states about their religious affiliations, beliefs and practices, and social and political views. They took this data and were able to then distinguish 44 different sects within the people who identify as Christian.
wild. Sorry if that example got a little bit off of the central point, let me refocus. So in religious evolution, these newly developed sects all of a sudden were placing a stronger emphasis on their feelings over their intellect. With this came the shattering of a shared religious view of reality that had existed for hundreds of thousands of years. Despite this shattering of a shared perspective, however, one group continued to be ignored in pretty significant ways women <laughs> now for women we know that oppression in patriarchal spaces is nothing new and all people generally understand that all historical religions began in a time when the world was focused solely on men but thanks to the field of women's studies we're seeing enormous contributions in regard to women finally being acknowledged and accepted more into religious spaces as leaders this is important because perspective is important and by putting different theories together we can take more steps towards discovering the truth. I'm also taking a gender and women's studies course this semester and while I'm reading the material for both of these courses I'm finding so many connections such as the intersectionality of faith, gender, race, and cultural upbringing and how we can see examples of feminist thinking in the way that women are making the changes that are happening right now. Women are becoming influential in the religions that they practice, which is crucial to furthering equality of all people in all spaces. Not only are women creating their own spirituality groups and reviving more female-centered religions like Wicca and astrology, and other earth-based spiritualities, but they're also working within their traditional religions and the systems they're in to bring about changes. By doing this, we can experience more perspectives about religion that are familiar to us as well as religions that we may have never heard of. Now, this next section of my video is going to seem more like a typical commentary YouTube video, the type that I primarily engage with in terms of the formatting, but be advised, I am not an experienced YouTuber, and uh, yeah, so please try not to roast me too hard for my lack of editing prowess, I'm doing my best. I'm now going to be showing clips of the TED Talks that we engaged with this week and sharing my reflections on them. I want to first talk about the most electric takeaway I had this week while reading and watching the videos that Dr. Glorian gave us. In the video with the longest title, Religion, Evolution, and the Ecstasy of Self-Transcendence, that's a mouthful, Jonathan Haidt uses the idea of a house with many rooms, most of which we're very familiar with. But sometimes it's as though a doorway appears from out of nowhere, and it opens onto a staircase. We climb the staircase and experience a state of altered consciousness. So this is one way to explain the way that we level up from rational thinking to post-rational thinking. And another way to think about this is through the Buddhist teachings of the two experiences that humans have, conditioned and unconditioned reality. A conditioned reality is the reality that is limited or restricted, whether by time and space, or through our experiences with family, education, race, and genders, and an unconditioned reality is a part of ourselves that can grow into a greater consciousness. Hate includes an expert from Stephen Bradley who had an experience where he believed that he encountered Christ. He uses this to exemplify one perspective on this metaphorical staircase. Bradley at one point in his excerpt says, quote, Previously to this time, I was selfish and self-righteous, but now I desired the welfare of all mankind and could, with feeling heart, forgive my worst enemies." End quote. Bradley's petty moralistic self just dies on the way up the staircase. And on this higher level, he becomes loving and forgiving. It goes on to tell us about world's religions and how they have many ways to climb the staircase. Some shut down the self using meditation. Others use psychedelic drugs. This is a, um, from a 16th century Aztec scroll. Others use dancing, spinning, and circling to promote self-transcendence. These are the notes after hearing that last example. Quote, going to flow, dropping acid, and spinning my hoop or my wand until the wee hours of the morning. 
and even now, five years sober, I still achieve a flow state when I spin my hoops, end quote. Let me give a little bit of brief context before I go on. For many years, every Wednesday, myself and a whole gaggle of other people would descend upon a Silomar beach with a bonfire, music, fire, and LED props. Some people sat by the fire, some played with fire, some played with LED props. Sometimes there were drugs and sometimes there were undercover cops. But all of that is to say that this gathering of flow became my weekly ritual. It became my church. You don't need a religion to get you through the staircase. Lots of people find self-transcendence in nature. Others overcome their self at raves. This ties into what I just said, and it makes me further think about remarks I've made regarding myself and flow and achieving a flow state. In the past, I have said, I feel like the real and true me when I'm flowing. And what I mean by that is that when I'm spinning my hoops, once I've reached a flow state, I am no longer the typically anxious or paranoid version of myself I most often inhabit. I'm no longer concerned with who or what is around me, who may or may not be watching or looking at me, what I look like, and I no longer feel or think anything about my feelings of self-doubt or my own insecurities. Another quote from my notes says, When I spin my hoops, the world around me melts away, and I feel at peace and one with the universe around me. Um, I enter this very meditative hypnotic trance-like state and there have been times when I did not have any kind of access to a flow prop and during these long periods of time it was miserable. It was so hard to feel positive or uplifted in any way but as soon as I would be able to get my hands on a prop and start spinning regularly everything was right in my world. The only other times I've experienced this type of trance state is when I'm driving late at night down curvy roads like 17 mile drive or highway 68. When I'm the only one on the road and the time of night or the weather conditions demand my full focus and my mindfulness. I also wrote, quote, I've often joked in the past that the art and practice of flow is my religion, but as I sit now writing this and watching this video, I'm thinking that maybe there's an aspect of truth to that belief. If not for me, then surely for someone out there, end quote. The self seems to thin out or melt away, and it feels good. It feels really good in a way totally unlike anything we feel in our normal lives. It feels somehow uplifting. Haight then goes on to say that war is one of the most common ways people experience self-transcendence. Many books about war say the same thing, that nothing brings people together like war, and that bringing them together opens up the possibility of extraordinary self-transcendent experiences. And he includes an excerpt from Glenn Gray, a U.S. Army soldier from World War II. I will let the excerpt play in full because I think the words within should be really shared and listened to rather than chopped up and dissected for the sake of commentary. After the war, he interviewed a lot of other soldiers and wrote about the experience of men in battle. Here's a key passage where he basically describes the staircase. Many veterans will admit that the experience of communal effort in battle has been the high point of their lives. I passes insensibly into a we, my becomes our, and individual fate loses its central importance. I believe that it is nothing less than the assurance of immortality that makes self-sacrifice at these moments so relatively easy. I may fall, but I do not die, for that which is real in me goes forward and lives on in the comrades for whom I gave up my life. Quote, individual faith loses its central importance, end quote. That was so profound to me, even though I have no firsthand personal experience to connect this with. The only connection that I really have is from watching from a distance as my boyfriend joined the Navy last February and the transformations he's made since. Otherwise, my life has been fairly selfish and self-interested. But after hearing these words, I long to search and find a way to navigate ascending my own staircase. And, and even though I'm not quite sure how to do that, I want to try.
All right, let's lighten up a little bit from talks of war and instead talk about our biases with Yasmin Abdel Majid. In her TED Talk, What Does My Headscarf Mean to You? She starts with a call to action for us to look into our biases and asks what assumptions that we have of women wearing headscarves or hijabs. Yasmin remarks about how this will not just be a TED Talk about the hijab because... As Lord knows, Muslim women are so much more than the piece of cloth they choose to wrap or not wrap their head in. I found that profound because while I know that it's a truth, I've not had the opportunity to speak with hijabi women about their choice or beliefs or reasonings to make the choice to wear a hijab. Instead, I tend to assume that they're oppressed either by their own religious values or by the beliefs of the men who dominate them or and or control them through religious doctrine, similar to how she mentioned in her introduction. Someone who looks like me walks past you in the street. Do you think they're a mother, a refugee, or a victim of oppression? Or do you think they're a cardiologist, a barrister, or maybe your local politician? Do you look me up and down, wondering how hot I must get, or if my husband has forced me to wear this outfit? I can walk down the street in the exact same outfit, and what the world expects of me and the way I'm treated depends on the arrangement of this piece of cloth. She then asks, What if I'd walked past you and later on you'd found out that actually I was a race car engineer? and that I designed my own race car and I ran my university's race team, because it's true. What if I told you that I was actually trained as a boxer for five years, because that's true too? Would it surprise you? Why? My notes on this said that yes, actually it did surprise me and the fact that it did made me feel an immense amount of guilt and shame because I finally realized that I do have a pre-existing bias that Muslim women do not or cannot participate in traditionally masculine activities like boxing, engineering, or working on an oil rig as she later reveals that she does. But why do I have that bias? Why is it that when I see a woman wearing a headscarf or a hijab in public, I feel pity for them, assuming that they have to wear the hijab, when logically, I know that at least where I live in the United States and in Canada, Wearing a headscarf or a hijab is a choice that the woman freely makes. I'm going to use these questions to help guide myself to more understanding. Rather than just biasfully assuming, I'm going to make an effort to go out there and seek out somebody who lives with this experience and ask them questions. My main takeaway from this video was that no matter the clothes I wear or the metaphorical hats I put on in our society, I'm still the same person at my core. This is me, right? But I'm also the woman in the rig clothes, and I'm also the woman that was in the ibaya at the beginning. The same applies to people of different races, genders, and religious beliefs. And like Yasmin says, We are all part of the system, and we can all be part of that solution. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a problem in our community with lack of opportunity especially due to unconscious bias, but each and every one of you has the potential to change that. And I encourage you to look past your initial perceptions. They're probably wrong. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we are finally reaching the end. I had the most takeaways from this video, but I will try my best to compile only the most important of them. Karen Armstrong's 2008 TED Talk is titled A Charter for Compassion, and it was filmed right here in Monterey, which, fun fact, is where the very first TED Talk conference was held. Anyway, the first question I had while watching this arose when Armstrong mentioned that in the UK, unlike the US, religion's very unpopular. This led me to ask, why? And so I asked, and according to an article by The Guardian in 2019, 52% of the public surveyed said that they don't belong to any religion, and studies indicate that this may be a generational trend as, quote, people tend to be less religious than their parents, end quote. She then goes on to say, In the Quran, uh, religious opinion, religious orthodoxy is dismissed as zanna, self-indulgent guesswork about matters that nobody can be certain of one way or the other, but which makes people quarrelsome and stupidly sectarian. <laughs> and this made me instantly think of how religious conservatism here in the US and how laws and regulations based on Christian beliefs could be described or considered as zanna. 
the people like Tucker Carlson or Mitch McConnell, they're not prophets and they're not influential religious leaders, even if they are treated as such and their politics or their show themes are religious in undertone, but they're not. Therefore, they are, are not and or at least should not be able to determine or enforce the meaning of their scriptures. In my opinion, they are self-indulgent and pre-rational thinkers who seem to think very little about communal interests, especially when they lobby for and create laws that harmfully regulate the choices of others. Armstrong goes on to speak about how the meaning of belief has changed. The word belief itself originally meant to love, to prize, to hold dear. In the 17th century, it narrowed its focus um, to include, to, to mean a, a, an intellectual assent to a set of propositions. Uh, credo, I believe, it did not mean I accept certain uh, creedal articles of faith. It meant I commit myself, I engage myself. She then asks, well, if religion is not about believing things, what is it about? Her answer, behaving differently. Quote, behave in a committed way, and then you begin to understand the truths of religion. Religious doctrines are meant to be summons to action, only understood when put into practice, end quote. And this relates back to a mystical understanding of religious study. My next profound takeaway was when she said, Compassion, the ability to feel with the other in the way we've been thinking about this evening, is the, not only the test of any true religiosity, it is also what will bring us into the presence of what Jews, Christians, and Muslims call God or the divine. Uh, it is compassion, says the Buddha, which uh, brings you to nirvana. This instantly made me think of conversations I've had recently with my mom, who was raised Christian but currently follows Buddhist practices and principles. We've discussed how, how Buddhist teaching tells us that healing can only happen once we begin to look outside of ourselves and begin sending our love and compassion to the universe around us. We cannot heal ourselves if we are only looking inward on ourselves or on the negative closely around us. But by outwardly expressing our love and positivity, healing and joy can then begin to come from within. And like Armstrong says, quote, when we feel with one another, we dethrone ourselves from the center of our world and we put another person there. When we rid ourselves of ego, we can find the divine." End quote. Armstrong then goes on to share the words of Rabbi Muir, who said, uh, The great Rabbi Meir said that uh, any um, interpretation of scripture which led to hatred and disdain or contempt of other people, any other people whatsoever, was illegitimate. This is kind of off the wall, but something that I feel really connects with this line of thinking is actually a lyric from a Macklemore song. The song is called Same Love, and it's a song about fighting for the rights of others, specifically those in the LGBTQ community. And there's a lyric about halfway through the song that says, quote, When I was in church, they taught me something else. If you preach hate at the service, those words aren't anointed, and that holy water that you soak in has been poisoned, end quote. I feel like this connects even deeper after Armstrong remarks on how religion has been hijacked. She uses the example of the spectacle of Christians endlessly judging each other, endlessly using scripture to argue and to put others down, rather than simply following Jesus' teachings of that we need to learn to love our enemies, love our neighbors, and love ourselves, and not judge others. I think the most important idea she shared with us was... Throughout the ages, uh, religion has uh, been used to oppress others, uh, and this is because of human ego, human greed. Due to pre-rational, self-indulgent thought and behavior that is focused on self-interest, religion has been weaponized. And that's why the study of religion is so crucial. If we don't approach the study of religion with a developmental model using rational and critical thinking, we have no hope of achieving the ultimate goal, peace among religions. To reach this goal, we must continue to focus on the common qualities of love, wisdom, and compassion. Thank you so much for watching my video. This was so much fun to research and make, and I took so much away from this lesson this week. I wish I could share it all, but I really don't want this video to be longer than I already know it's going to be. So I hope this video isn't too long. 
and I hope I summarized, reflected, and explained myself in a concise yet thorough enough way that you can understand what I'm saying and hopefully learn a little bit more from what I've shared. As I mentioned at the beginning, all of my sources are going to be listed in the description box below and you can follow any of those to start your own research and develop your own thoughts, opinions, or beliefs. I highly recommend to anyone watching this that isn't in my class to at the very least check out the TED Talk videos linked below and maybe the websites of each of the speakers. Now, for the people who are in my class, first, I'm so sorry this was so long, but hopefully it was enjoyable enough. What were your main takeaways from the lesson this week, and how did they compare or differ from mine? Is there anything I didn't mention that you think was important to be included? Was there something I did mention that you thought wasn't important and should have been left out? Let me know what you think in the comments below and through our class discussion page. And I once again want to give a huge thank you to Dr. Glorian, for providing me with the opportunity to create assignment that I feel really helped me better learn, understand, and engage with the course materials this week. And with that, the video is over, and I'll see you next week. Bye!